Hello everyone and welcome to the ACNC webinar today. As you can see on the screen, the title of today's webinar is the Australian Charities Report 2016. And we have a very special guest to co-present today's webinar, which um, again, as you can see on the screen, Dr. Abigail Powell from the Centre for Social Impact at the University of New South Wales. Hello, Dr. Abigail. Hi, Matt, how are you? Good, thanks. And we have quite an audience today, all keen to hear some of the key findings of the report that was produced late last year. Just before we do get into it though, just a couple of um, admin things to clear up. If you're having trouble with your audio, um, you have an option to call into the webinar using your phone. So in the uh, registration confirmation email that you would have gotten once you registered, there are instructions there of the number you can call, the access code you can put in, and then you can listen to the webinar via your phone. That often works uh, better if you're having trouble with audio over Wi-Fi or an internet connection. Also, we'll um, be recording this webinar and we will publish it on our website in the coming days. So if you have to take off early or if something doesn't work or whatever happens, you can come back and watch it at your own convenience later on. And we will send out a, a follow-up email once we have published it to let you know that it's published with including some um, useful links to other resources that we mentioned throughout. And as we go throughout, feel free to ask questions using the uh, question um, option on the GoToWebinar navigation panel on your screen. You should be able to ask a question there. And we have a couple of colleagues, Chris and Heath, who are sitting back waiting to answer all the questions that come through. So send them through as they pop up and we'll do our best to answer them. But of course, if so many are coming through and we, we can't get to them, um, we might not be able to respond as quickly as you would like, but we will endeavor to respond to you by email later on if we don't get to your question through the, um, in the allocated time for the webinar. And just on questions, um, we will um, allow 10 or 15 minutes or so at the end of the formal presentation to take questions live there and then. So if you wanted to wait for the formal presentation to finish and then take your, uh, ask your question, feel free to do so. Okay, that out the way, we will get started on, to, on the formal presentation. So um, Abby, can I get you just to give us a brief overview of what, well, firstly, the Centre for Social Impact, what is the Centre for Social Impact and, and your role in particular at the Centre for Social Impact and in this project? Yeah, thanks Matt. So, um, hi everyone. I'm the a Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Social Impact, which is part of UNSW, the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Um, the Centre for Social Impact is a national and research and education centre um, dedicated to catalyzing social change for a better world. So no mean feat there. Um, yeah. We are almost 10 years old. We're 10 years old this year. And CSI is um, a little bit unusual in that it actually sits across three universities. So we have um, what we refer to as the CSI nodes at UNSW Sydney, University of Western Australia and Swinburne University of Technology as well. And we have um, teams of researchers at all of those universities, as well as um, running education programs as well for both undergraduates and postgraduates. But one of our key focuses is really on catalyzing change and producing knowledge that is easily accessible, but based on really rigorous research findings. In terms of the reports that I'm presenting today, um, I was um, what in the, acad ac the academic world we call the chief investigator, but essentially uh, um, I was the project director of our analysis of the annual information statements that the ACNC collects from registered charities. And um, while I am the face behind the numbers or the voice behind the numbers, I should say today, um, I'd also like to quickly acknowledge the cast of many who have worked on the data and the report, both um, the support of the ACNC, but also um, colleagues at the Centre for Social Impact and also from the Social Policy Research Centre, which is another research centre at the University of New South Wales. Um, and we've partnered um, with SPRC on this work. Um, 
we have been doing the analysis of this data for three years now. So this is the third report we've produced for the ACNC. Um, and I'm pretty proud to say it's one of the most comprehensive records of the Australian charity sector. And this one in particular, Abby, the, just to um, address the title from the outset, it is the Australian Charities Report 2016, and given we're now in February 2018, feels a fair way away. Can you just uh, talk us through that for a moment? Yes, I can. So um, many of the listeners um, probably work for charities and are aware that they have to um, submit the annual information statements on an annual basis, as the name suggests. Um, but charities um, have a um, certain amount of time at the end of their financial year to submit that AIS statement. Um, for some charities, their financial year will end mid, mid year in 2016, but for some of them, that will actually be um, the end of the calendar year of 2016. So people have some time during 2017 to actually pull all their data together and get their statements submitted to the ACNC. So there's a process there. And then towards the second half of the 2017 is where we've actually been analysing the data, um, which actually takes much longer than you might think it does. It's quite a big data set. We have over 52,000 charities in the data set. And there are things that we do around cleaning the data, finding any any errors that might be there and and so on. So the report was actually released in December last year. Um, so some of you might have had a chance to have a look at the report, um, but if not, um, this is this is a great introduction to it as well. Yeah, right. So it is it is the most up to date um, report on the charity sector. Don't be fooled by the 2016 in the name. And um, let's get on to some of the findings of the report. Um, the first one here, uh, charity subsectors. What did the research report find about the makeup of the charity sector in Australia? Yeah, so this has been fairly consistent over the last um, two to three years that we've been analysing the data. And what it shows is that almost one third of charities um, report that their main activity is religion. So a big proportion of the charity sector is made up of religious charities. Um, almost one in five charities identify themselves as education and research charities, and that includes universities and also schools. I was actually quite surprised when I um, first started working on this data that universities um, are classified as charities. And I think there's a few little surprises in the data like that. Some organisations that people might not actually think of as charities are actually registered charities. Yeah, right. I think that's a pretty common um, a common surprise that many people find. And just quickly on religion, sorry, before we get into the other ones, it, that, that doesn't mean that 30% are solely religious though, right? That, that means that 30% um, of charities identify themselves as having religion as a, as a purpose, and that could be amongst other purposes. Yeah, so for all of the, um, the structure of the annual information statement is that charities are asked to identify what they see as their main activity and they have a choice of several different options there. Um, so this is people who put religion as their primary um, their primary activity. Um, right, right. And there's some differences in the data that we have seen where charities that you might think of as quite, as quite similar have um, self-selected slightly different options. So for example, if you think of a um, religious school, one religious school might say that their religion is their main activity, but the second religious school might actually say that education is their main activity. Wow, so that right, often they yeah. work in the data like that. Um, but in the report, we also look at um, what combination of um, main activities people se selected. So you could select secondary activities as well. Right. The other um, thing that pops up in religion and crosses over with other charities, charity types as well, is for example, people like, um, thinking of big, big names here now, um, people like um, St Vinny's, um, oh, Anglicare, 
so, so on. So they might, again, either categorise themselves as social services or religion, for example. Right, right. And interestingly, there down the bottom, international um, takes only 1%. I think many people... Yeah just generally thinking of charity we think many of them operate in um, conflict zones or, or uh, countries that need um, their support but one percent is a fairly small number yeah it's a, it is a small number and I agree that it's quite surprising and I'll come back a little bit later and talk a bit more about um, the charities that do operate overseas um, again a bit later yeah just moving on to the locations, it, it seems as though this um, reflects fairly closely the population spread in the country. Yes, it very much does. So um, New South Wales has the biggest population and it has the biggest concentration of charities as well. Um, on average, there are 2.1 charities for operating for every 1,000 people in Australia. Um, I think, um, from my collection, that's relatively on par with other countries. Um, and uh, just for any eagle eyes out there, the numbers in the um, picture of Australia do add up to more than 100%. And that's because um, there are a number of charities that operate in more than one location. Uh, okay, right, right, yep. So they might have a headquarters somewhere, but have operations in, in multiple states. Yeah, exactly. And um, if you want to go on to the next slide, Matt, that's um, illustrated yes. there further. So the top line kind of reflects um, the map again as well. So um, two thirds of charities are um, based in major cities. They have their headquarters in major cities. Around a third are based in regional areas and just three percent in rural and remote areas and that based right. in line does refer to like their headquarters so to speak so while yes. only three percent of charities have headquarters or their main offices in rural and remote areas we know that many more charities are actually operating in those locations so linking back to the overlap with the numbers um 83% of charities did only operate in one state or territory, but 13% operated in multiple states and territories, and 8% actually did work overseas as well. So that's linking back to that international component earlier. Yeah, right. And similarly, this could be that charities uh, have operations both overseas and, and in Australia too, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, yeah, um, so, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, the 83% is mutually exclusive to the 13 and the 8, but there could be some overlap between the 13 and the 8%. So right. those charities that are kind of operating in multiple places nationally are more likely to be the ones that are also helping communities overseas. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And how about charity sizes? I think um, this is something that many people might not have an idea about it or an instinct that where the majority of charities sit on this small, medium and large scale? Yeah, this is really um, quite interesting and we all, I think that we all know, we can all think of big charity names, um, but even then we might not think of just how big they are. So around 17% of charities are what we refer to as large char charities, which means that they have an annual revenue of over a million dollars a year. Um, but the vast majority of charities are actually small. So two thirds of charities have a revenue stream of less than $250,000 a year. Yeah, right. And within that, um, actually 40% are extra small charities, which are charities operating with less than $50,000 revenue a year. Yeah, right. That's sort of really tiny, isn't it? If you compare it to the scale of small, medium and large. Absolutely. Okay. And what, is, what does the uh, report find with revenue um, as a collective? Yeah. So um, overall, the charity sector in Australia in 2016 had a combined revenue of over $142 billion. The charity sector is really 
quite substantial um, financially speaking and economically yeah, speaking. Yeah. In fact, um, we did a bit of a comparison of where the charity sector fits in comparison to other industries. And the charity sector is ninth among Australian industries in terms of income. Well, that is surprising. I think not many people would have um, predicted that if you'd asked them to, to place them on that scale. Yeah, exactly. Um, also interesting is where that revenue comes from. Um, so around 50% of revenue comes from other incomes, so that includes things like sales, member fees, paid services, um, that could include things like um, buying raffle tickets from a charity, it could include things like buying branded t-shirts, it could include um, paying for aged care services, for example. A big proportion okay, of grants, 43% yeah, right. comes from the government, and I think that might surprise some people as well. So I think that reflects a, the fact that a lot of services are actually contracted out by government and um, delivered by charities now. And only 7% oh, okay, comes in through donations and bequests so people just um making regular donations or um big big charity um donations in um from philanthropists and that kind of thing yeah right well, i think that would be one um surprising point for many people we often think of charities as receiving most of their income from just donations, people in the street collecting or online donations and that sort of thing. But clearly the report shows that that's not the case. And whilst it's still a, a massive number, really, more than 10 billion is, is, is large, yeah. it's, it's small in comparison to the, the total income of the sector. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that will be a surprise for many people. And obviously that mix um, varies a lot charity by charity. Charity. So there, were, there are some charities that are much more likely to rely on donations and bequests, but when we look at the sector as a whole, donations and bequests really make up quite a small proportion of funding to the charity sector. Yeah, right. Surprising. And so how does it break down according to those, uh, well, according to sizes in general? We spoke about small, medium and large, but when you have a look at the revenue and who takes the biggest slice of the pie, how does it look? Yeah, I think this is absolutely fascinating. So um, I mentioned the 142 billion in revenue, but one percent one percent of the biggest charities actually equal are equal to 50 percent of the sector's revenue. So one percent of charities were responsible for over 70 billion dollars in revenue. Yeah, right. That's that is very um, surprising. And it's huge. I don't think many expected that yeah and then if we go to the next the top 10 percent that's equal to 90 percent so 130 yeah, billion right. um and actually the smallest 50 percent of charities have less than one percent of revenue so um half of the charity sector is equal to um only 1.4 billion dollars so it's really interesting yeah. to see that spread of revenue across the across the sector yeah it's completely um i think it's it's counterintuitive i think a lot of people would think that there's a more even spread it's it, mm. because charities get their donations from just people handing over some um, money in the street so there'd be naturally a, a more even spread but um, yeah, clearly the bigger ones are responsible for a lot more revenue than, than well, I would have thought, yeah. It's definitely interesting and on the next slide we look a little bit about which, where those um, bigger, the big end of town are in terms of charities are operating. So um, I mentioned earlier that I was surprised that universities were um, actually classified as um, charities, yeah. but that's reflected here. So higher education is one of the biggest um, 
charity types in terms of that revenue and that makes sense when you do know that universities are, char are charities because they're bringing in um, a heck of a lot of revenue through students but also research income as well and that yeah I um, guess some of the bigger universities would be responsible for hundreds of millions themselves absolutely yeah yeah and in fact if you look at the report um, and that's available online and we'll talk a bit more about where that is available later but you can actually see the top charities um, the biggest charities by their revenue in the report oh okay right and even um, here so on this yeah, slide I, the, the top two categories take uh, education because the second one with 18 percent is still in the education field exactly so primary and secondary education and that in, that includes um non-government schools as well um right. closely followed by aged care activities and we know that um australia is an aging society so that's um that's interesting too and just looking at expenditure um what did the report find there? Yep, so charities spent um, in the 2016 financial year just over $137 billion pursuing their charitable purposes. And if we think about revenue as well, that means that around 95% of charity revenue is spent by charities actually pursuing um, their charitable purposes. Um, Obviously, there's uh, again a lot of variation between charities, um, but I think that um, people will be reassured to know that charities aren't just hoarding this revenue that they're getting, they are actually spending it on delivering their services and their purpose. Um, we also saw an increase in expenditure in 2016, which was slightly higher. Part of that's reflected in the increase in revenue. So there was a slight increase in revenue too, but the increase in expenditure is slightly higher than the increase in revenue. Okay, interesting. And what about employees um, and volunteers? You mentioned that the sector itself was um, ranked fairly high um, as a sector as far as revenue goes. Is that reflected in the amount of people that are employed by the charity sector? It is, and perhaps even more so. So charities um, employed in 2016 around 1.3 million people. And that's over 10% of the workforce in Australia. So one in 10 people in the workforce work for charities. That's pretty huge and makes the charity sector second only to the retail industry in terms of um, employment. So that's yeah, pretty right. huge. And on top of that, the charity sector is engaging around 2.9 million volunteers. So we found that four out of five charities engaged volunteers. So there's a really high use um, of volunteers, even among bigger charities. And what was really interesting is that almost one in two charities were operating without any paid staff. So they were relying almost entirely on volunteers. And I think that really speaks to the value of um, volunteers in the charity sector. Many charities literally couldn't operate without volunteers. Yeah, it'd fall apart without the, the generosity of volunteers. Um, as you mentioned earlier on, the largest section of the charity sector is uh, small charities and clearly yeah. that would um, be the um, the ones that make up most of this 49.6 percent that operate with no paid staff i would have thought yeah absolutely yeah but that 1.3 million is also significant in that many people assume charities i, I think that many people would assume charities um operate with volunteers and in some cases people think charities operate solely with volunteers but to see that employees stack up to 1.3 million would be um, pretty surprising too 
Yeah, I think so. And just how big an employer um, the charity sector is. But if we think about what those top charity sectors, the biggest charity sectors were, things like education and research. So it's teachers, it's lecturers, social services was up there. So it's and health and aged care services. So it's people, many of these um, Charities require people to actually deliver services and often um, they'll be in professional roles doing that. Yeah, right. And how about overseas operations? I think this is one of the um, features of charity work that many people th think is pretty common, but we saw that only 1% of the sector in Australia uh, identified as having overseas operations. What does that breakdown look like? Um, so we were able um, in 2016 the AIS, AIS um, asked people to report in a bit more detail on overseas operations for the first time. So um, I'll just clarify, we mentioned the 1%, that's 1% who identified their main activity as international. Oh, okay. Actually what we found was 8.4% of charities have some operations overseas. So it might be, for example, that a charity identifies as um, a emergency relief charity, but they do do some of their work overseas. Uh, but what, okay, we yep, the, what we did for the first time was we were able to dig a little bit deeper with those new questions. And so charities that tick that they operated overseas were asked for a little bit to provide a little bit more information about what that actually involved and what we saw was that just under three percent said that they transferred funds or goods overseas so that might be for example um giving funds to a local charity and the local charity then um delivers services and only 1.7 percent of those charities operating overseas actually um, were what you'd call operational in a technical sense, so that were actually delivering programs. Okay, yeah, and uh, interestingly, the countries there on the side, the uh, I think the third one would stick out to some people. Is there an explanation yeah. why New Zealand is so high? Yeah, um, this is probably anecdotal, but my guess around this is that, um, and we could uh, do a bit more analysis of the data probably to dip into this and see, but that there would be some of the larger charities in particular, though, those ones that are operating across multiple states in Australia, might be um, charities that actually their organisational structure is that they operate over Australia and New Zealand. Ah, uh, okay. Right. It's not that they're delivering programs, social services programs in New Zealand, uh, addressing a need there. It's just that the operations may cross over into both countries. Yeah. So it could be that, um, and I can't think of an example off the top of my head, sorry, but it could be that um, someone's delivering services, a charity is set up with operations across the two countries, and but that the governance of that is dual, um, is single so it, they're not separate organizations as such um so it would be supporting if it was a social services charity they could be providing services both in um sydney for example and in auckland yeah right the um, other interesting the, thing around that was that charities were operating charities who said they were operating overseas were operating in on average three to four countries overseas. So people weren't on the whole, there were not, there was a spread of charities operating in only one country to um, a number of countries, but the average was three to four countries. Ah, okay, yeah. Well, that is interesting. I think a lot of people would, um would assume that some of these international aid charities are operating in multiple locations, but the extent to which their operations cover different countries would probably be an unknown. But that's interesting that it's three to four on average. Yeah. And what did the report find, or the report this year looked in particular at the effect of the NDIS? Yeah, so the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So this is the, the first year that the um, 
annual information statement has asked more questions about the NDIS. So um, before people were asked about the NDIS, they were asked whether um, a beneficiary of their charity was disability or not. And we found out that 9.2% um, of all charities said that they helped people with a disability. Now of that 9.2%, 8% said that they were currently providing services funded by the NDIS. Um, this was probably a bit lower than I probably expected, but another 20% said that they were intending to provide services in the next um, financial year. So it'll be interesting to see the data um, from 2017. But I think that reflects the fact that the NDIS has been rolled out relatively slowly. And that's also yes. reflected in these um, state figures that are on the slide too. So you can, we can see that actually in Tasmania, 26% of um, charities that said they were supporting people with a disability we're providing services funded by the NDIS much higher than that 8% average. But we know that in Tasmania, the rollout of the NDIS began in 2013 for young people and has been rolled out by age group. And the ACT similarly was one of the first um, states to start rolling out the um, to start rolling out the NDIS. It was introduced there in 2014 and has um, been in full operation since 2016. Right, right. That explains the sort of disproportionate um, weighting towards states that would ordinarily have smaller numbers. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that we looked at in terms of the NDIS was um, Charities that said they were providing services via the NDIS, um, what did they say that their main activities were? And um, the answer to that is on the right hand side of the slide. So 30% of charities supporting the NDIS were said that their main activity was social services, 17% health services, and 9% aged care activities. So that's also um, quite interesting. And this report um, looked specifically at charities registered with ORIC as well, which is, as you can see on the screen, the Office of the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations. Question specific to these organisations. Yeah, so um, there are a number of charities that are registered with the Office of the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations, and they report to ORIC instead of to the ACNC. Um, so the first time that ACNC were able to obtain that um, data for us and we were able to merge that in with our analysis, um, the reporting requirements are slightly different. So we couldn't always um, merge the data together on every single variable. So these are some um, of the, the statistics that were specific to those ORIC charities. And there were 711 of those charities um, their categorization of main activities was slightly different to in the AIS, but around a third were health and community services, and 17% um, said that their main activities were around land management, which I think makes sense when we think about um, Indigenous corporations as well. Um, yeah, and some big numbers there on the side we can see with the yeah. um, income and expenses. Yeah, it's interesting it'd be, and it'd be interesting to dig a bit more into this, but I, I think that the Oric charities seem to be um, punching above their weight slightly. So they had um, income of around $1.48 billion and expenditure around $1.38 billion. And they also employed just over 9,000 people. So that's interesting too. Yeah, for a cohort of just over 700, those numbers are, are pretty massive. Yeah. Okay, and just um, taking a, 
a bit of an overview of the, the report, having done all this hard work and analysis in investigating what was provided to the ACNC in charities' annual information statements. How would you um, summarise the main findings and, and the, the insights that people can get from looking into the report in more detail? Yeah, well, I think that I think that one of the key things is that the charity sector in Australia is really economically and socially significant in terms of what it's doing financially. Yeah. Um, it's a massive employer, but we also like Australia is reliant on the um, charity sector for um, a range of different. Um, activities. As I think one of the other points I want to make is that the charity sector is actually really diverse and to some to some to a big extent in fact when when we're asked to do a presentation like this um, we have to speak to averages and that can mask to some degree the diversity um, so I'd just like to stress that um, the numbers that we've talked about primarily today are averages and there is huge variation amongst Australia's charity sector. But I think what's really important about this data is that it really helps to deepen our knowledge about the sector and that can be used to help inform policy but it's also been really useful in terms of engaging the sector as well. So. Um, quite often when people are required to report data that data goes into some vault and people don't know what's done with the data and they don't really understand why they're required to report but they do it because they have to and yeah. i think that acnc has been really great at actually delivering that data back to people as well so they can see how useful it is they can play with the data themselves even and they see the value of filling in those reports every year. And that can also get behind that mask that you spoke about that the averages provides when exactly. people dive into the data and find some more about it, you can see that diversity fully exposed really. And that is your third point, range of ways to engage with the data. Um, yes. How can people do this if they wanted to know more? So we have um, what we've called an inter interactive microsite, and I think we have the website address in a, at the end of the of the slide deck. But um, we obviously have a pretty hefty report that has all the data. But if you're not, if you're, and some people will find that really useful. But if you are, have a specific interest, we have. Um, the microsite where you can actually go and play and explore the data yourself. So if you want to flip to the next slide, Matt. There we go. Yep. Um, this is one example of how you can play with the data. So on the left hand side of the screen, we've got a map of Australia. Those little dots that you can see, they're all of the charities around Australia. And on the um, right hand side, I've zoomed into that so you can see um, the far northeast of Queensland and you can see the dots a bit clearer but you can actually click on those dots and see exactly what those charities are and the colour coding of the charities relates to the type of charity that they are in terms of their main activity whether that's culture and recreation health and so on so that's one way you can play with the data um, in the box on the left you can also see at the top there's a range of different titles so you can look at things like um, geography, income and expenditure, um, people, the age of charities and then you can filter that data by size as we've spoken about today, by um, main activities and a range of other things too. So you can really go and look at the data almost any way you want to. Yeah really pinpoint particular types of charities based on those metrics um, yeah. and of course it, that could as you mentioned before that could be used to um, help a charity uh, figure out its expansion plans or funding sources or policies and at government level so there's, there are plenty of ways that this can um, have, have an effect in the real world I suppose. Yeah 
Yes, absolutely. So it's not just uh, an academic exercise <laughs> for fun. And it, no, it, it actually has some applications. Um, people are really using the data, which is great to great for us to hear as researchers as well. And where can I get it? So our website is Australian Charities. So importantly, there's no www dot here. It's just australiancharities.acnc.gov.au, and you can see the full report there and you can do that playing around with the data as well um we also Interesting have point about the www because i found that out the yeah. hard way i kept getting an <laughs> error and thinking what's one of the websites gone down but that's the that's the um the culprit yeah. don't put www and otherwise you'll be scratching your head like i was yeah absolutely and um also on the website over the last um three years that we've been working on the data each year with um delved a little deeper into certain areas as well and we've called these special interest reports but so far we have a um we have special interest reports on australia's smallest charities so those with um less than fifty thousand dollars revenue a year we've dug a bit deeper into those we've also looked at australia's aged care charities australia's disability charities we've done a bit more on um charities involved overseas and also red tape and reporting obligations as well. So if you're interested in any of those specific topics, you can um, not only play with the data, but read those special interest reports. And in the next couple of weeks, we'll be launching um, a special interest report on Australia's grant making charities. And that includes, but isn't limited to, what we've called structured philanthropy so things like trusts and ancillary funds but there's also a big um, portion of charities that you might not think of as um, philanthropic charities but who a portion of their charity work is giving grants to other people or charities as well and like I said that's due for release wow. around the end of February so keep your eyes out for that. Um, all those special interest reports that Abby just mentioned, we will include um, uh, the, the list of them in the follow-up email that we send to you after in the next couple of days after this webinar. So you will be able to um, have a look at the titles and then get them from, from the same um, point though on, on that yeah. interactive microsite at australiancharities.acnc.gov.au. Um, We've had a couple of questions come through, if you don't mind hanging around for a few minutes, Abby, to answer a couple. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one question came through about this report, it touches on your smaller interest reports actually, because this report seems to be skewed towards the larger charities given their economic significance and yeah. the um, employment. Um, well, first, would you agree with that assessment or is that just simply the nature of the beast? Um, I think it's partly the nature of the beast in that when we look at averages, that's what happens because it, when we're looking yeah. at financial averages, for example. But if you look in the report, in the main report, um, almost all of the statistics are broken down by size categories. And we actually go a little bit further than the large, medium, small to look at um, what we've called XXL charities, and they're charities with um, revenue over a hundred million dollars. That's big numbers, right. but um, there are around a hundred or so of those. Um, we have categories, we've categorized charities as XL, which is those with between 10 million and a hundred million in revenue. Large charities, right. um, a million to 10 million, medium charities, small and extra small as well. So a lot of the data in the report has been broken down by those size categories already. So you can see, like, for example, if you're an extra small charity, um, thinking about what an extra large charity is doing, it's not, it's comparing apples and oranges. But if you want to compare your charity to other extra small charities, that breakdown has already been done for you in the report. 
Okay, great. Yeah, so the, the bigger picture, uh, high level view of it is mostly averages and it can appear that it is skewed by the yes. significant weight of the large charities. But once you once you get into the details of the report, you've accounted for that. Um, yeah. There was a, a sort of a question related to that, but I think I think you might have answered it, but it was a question that asked about the extra large because one of the earlier slides we had that um, there's extra small, those that are less than 50,000. Um, but also the report obviously has found the other end of that scale with extra large. And you said it was a hundred or so fit into the extra, extra large category. Yeah, let me just double check that for you because I have the report in front of me. Okay. Um, and just off the top of your head, would you assume that many of those are universities before you uh, yeah, find the... A big number of those are universities there. Um, so 160 um, charities in 2016 were charities with 100 million or more in revenue. Um, and okay. they are primarily higher education institutions. And I think there are also a large um, number of health related charities in there too, which are primarily, I think, health foundations. Right, right. Okay. Uh, I think. Uh, just in, on the. Yeah, yeah go on. Oh, no, no go on. I was going to move on to another question, but if you've got something to add for the last one, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say the 2016 report has a list of the largest. 10 or 20 charities and the 2015 main report has a list of all charities that had um, revenue of over a hundred million dollars so if you're interested specifically in finding out well who are these charities you can go and have a look at that yeah I think there will be a lot of people that would be interested to see those those names um, is there a state breakdown for income we speak in uh, big aggregate numbers and yep. we know that certain uh, charities operate in certain states. Uh, I understand that it may be difficult to pinpoint, but is there a way that people can find out the revenue broken down by state? Yes, um, and this is, this is slightly complicated because we can only look at it in terms of where charities headquarters or that um, main office address is. So, Okay. We can't look at it in terms of where they're operating if they've got multiple operations. But if a charity has their headquarters in Tasmania, um, their revenue would be attached to um, Tasmania. Long story short, I think, again, it's largely reflective of the population. So New South Wales, Victoria, they would be the biggest in terms of revenue. Um, and the smaller states, smaller. I think the ACT might punch slightly above its weight because um, it's it's our capital city. There'll be a few big charities that have their headquarters in the um, capital. Yep. Um, but again, if you were specifically interested in that, state and territory jurisdiction is one of the things that you can filter data by um, on the web on the micro site. Yep, right. Um, and ju just one final one. We've got a few questions coming through, but we're sort of running out of time. We've already ticked over 50 minutes. But one that um, is for you with your researcher hat on, Abby, is there anything that you would like to be able to collect or you wish was available in the data set to be able to have a, have a look at and, and analyse? any particular feature of the charity sector that you think would be interesting? That's a really good question. I think something that's um, probably quite topical is having a bit more of a detailed breakdown on where charities spend their money. Um, I think that's a pretty okay, topical yeah. one. Um, and the data as it's collected currently only breaks that down at a fairly high level. So for example, expenses on employees, um, expenses on grants to other charities, and, um, and then I think it's other expenses. So it'd be interesting to um, see 
where exactly um, funding is spent and, and and obviously that looks different and what's appropriate looks different for different types of charities with different structures and doing different things um, but I think from a public perception people are people want to see that their funding is going to actual service delivery if you like what I'm quite interested in personally is things like capacity building and that kind of thing and seeing what resources are invested in staff who work in um, charities, for example. Um, yeah, right. but one of the things that we're also doing, um, and I'll, I'll give another quick plug for, which I think will be really interesting, is looking at how charities have been changing over time. So 2016 was the fourth um, year of the annual information statement. It was the third year that financial data has been collected. So we're just writing up at the moment um, a report that is looking at how the charity sector has been changing over time. Um, and I'm really excited to see that what, what that report will tell us. Um, that's a little way off publication that will probably be launched around April time. Okay, we'll definitely keep an eye out for that. And it's will be fascinating because it's the first time this has ever been done, given that the AIS is providing all this data on charities for the first time and these Australian yeah. charities reports give us a, a new insight into the charity sector. No one's been able to do the comparative analysis and come up with a picture of change over a set period of time. No, it's brand new, so it's very exciting and watch this space. We will definitely make a, um, some noise about that when it's published. So keep um, in touch with us on um, all the various ways you can on social media and, and um, subscription to emails, which brings me to the next slide and time to wrap up. Although um, there are a couple of questions that we will uh, have to get to via email. We've sort of run out of time here. Um, do stay in touch with the ACNC via the commissioner's column and email updates. Um, we've got plenty of webinars like this as well available on the on the website um, and we've got we're pretty um, active on social media Facebook Twitter and YouTube and also our range of podcasts for different um, chats about different topics of importance to the to charities and, and the charity sector more broadly Thank you for um, coming along and paying attention to our presentation today. Well, Abby's presentation really on the Australian Charities Report. If you have any feedback about the webinars in specifically, um, send us an email at education at acnc.gov.au. We like to hear from you about these sorts of activities and find ways in which we can improve them and make them better. So, so um, send us an email if you have any ideas. And just as when we close the webinar, you will res receive um, the opportunity to do a survey, which is, I think from memory, only three questions and takes about 10 seconds. Um, we get a lot of um, valuable feedback out of that. So if you've got the time, please fill in the survey and we can um, use it to help improve our webinars. Abby, thank you very much for your time today and all your thank effort you on producing the report. Thank you. And I'm sure if people have any more questions for um, Centre for Social Impact and for about this report in general, directed at Abby and the other researchers, feel free to send us an email at that email address there, educationacnc.gov.au. Abby, is there any contact details that you have that you would like, or would you be happy to take them at educationacnc.gov.au? Um, yeah, that's fine. Happy for you to forward anything that's um that's more relevant to us than you guys absolutely yeah right okay thanks very much everyone and thanks to chris and heath for answering all the questions in the background we really appreciate your attention today and um, look forward to you joining us for another webinar in the future get to the australian charities um, report website play around with the data and see what you can find thanks abby thanks matt thank you